Okay, folks, let's get started. I just discovered uh, a minute ago, uh, thanks to a student who pointed out to me, that the, the uh, highlights for May 7th are not correct. In fact, the 7th, the 7th and the 10th both are the same. So I've screwed up a link or something. So I apologize for that. Um, I will fix the May 7th link. So hopefully, um, I didn't erase it somewhere, and I'll have to write the whole thing again. But I've been able to do that too. All right, so we're moving along with energy. And um, I hope that you um, understood what I had to say the other day. Um, I recognize that's calculation related, and I recognize that causes some anxiety. So as always, if I can be of help to you, let me know. I did send out a message today urgently asking for some tutors for BioCam, and I actually have several tutors lined up. If you're interested in a tutor, let me know. Uh, I've heard from a couple of you already. Uh, but I do have some people who will do it. They, they, they do it for pay, but they, will, they are more than willing to tutor you. Uh, the TA is free tutoring during office hours, and of course, you're always welcome to come talk to me if you, if you have questions as well. So whatever works for you, let's get the uh, things going. Okay, um, so energy. Uh, delta G, I think you should be able to do fairly straightforward basic calculations, kind of like you did with Henderson Hasselbach that don't require a calculator. And I gave you some examples in class the other day. Uh, yesterday, and um, I think those are um, useful things for you to be able to do. So the reason that we do these uh, energy calculations is we really want to determine the direction of a reaction. Okay, The direction of a reaction is very important for us because reactions are reversible, and understanding uh, what makes a reaction go is very, very useful and important to us. So we want to be able to make those sorts of determinations. I think also having an understanding in terms of what an energetically favorable reaction is, an energetically unfavorable reaction is. I mentioned that briefly yesterday. And those are also a, all a part of this. So you can look at a delta G zero prime value and say, wow, this thing really doesn't want to go forwards uh, very much. Or wow, this one really doesn't want to go backwards very much, etc." So that you should be able to look at things and be able to make those determinations. Now, energy is critical for other reasons. Um, the number one, of course, being that it takes energy to do work. It takes energy to synthesize molecules. Okay? When we talk about metabolism, which is what we're rapidly moving in the direction of right now, when we talk about metabolism, we are talking about the sum of the chemical reactions that are occurring in living cells. Notice I said it's the sum of the reactions that are occurring in living cells. This includes the reactions that are involved in breaking down things. It also includes the reactions that are involved in making up things. Synthesis versus breakdown. Okay? Synthesis reactions are called anabolic. Okay? Anabolic reactions are those that build, make big things starting with small things. Anabolic reactions in general require input of energy. So if I want to make a protein, I need to put energy into making that protein. If I want to make sugar, I need to put energy into making that sugar. If I want to make a fat, same thing. All these things, anabolic reactions where we're making something bigger out of something smaller, require energy. In addition, anabolic reactions are what we call reductive in nature. Okay? Reductive, meaning that we need sources of electrons and protons to make them. So we have reducing reactions involved in, an, an, in anabolic processes. We have energy required for anabolic processes. These are all involved in making things. When we go breaking down things, those reactions are called catabolic, C-A-T-A-B-O-L-I-C. Catabolic reactions are involved in breaking down things. You eat so that you have food to break down things. When you break down things, you produce energy. 
So catabolic reactions tend to release energy instead of requiring energy. Catabolic reactions are oxidative in nature, meaning that they, the molecules are giving up protons and electrons. We oxidize things. We oxidize sugar to get a lot of our energy. That oxidation, that energy that comes from that oxidation is harvested to make, ultimately, ATP. Okay? So catabolic reactions give us energy. Anabolic reactions require energy. Very important uh, concepts. Well, virtually all of the energy biologically on the face of the Earth comes ultimately from the sun. Virtually everything. Probably 99.999% of all the biological energy on, this, on the face of the earth can be traced to the sun. Plants, of course, are the main harvesters of that energy. Animals eat plants. Bacteria eats everything. Okay? But ultimately, that energy source is the sun. We see, as we look through this, that we see on the top, we see pros, things that are, are energy uh, containing. We see glucose. We see ATP. And at the bottom, we see things that are the products of the breakdown of these, ADP, carbon dioxide and water, etc. Proteins we make from amino acids. When we break proteins down, we go back to making amino acids. Amino acids can also be oxidized, ultimately, to carbon dioxide and water. Okay? So anabolic, catabolic processes. And now we start to see why we want to understand the direction a reaction goes. A reaction going in one direction may be anabolic. In the other direction, it may be catabolic. So understanding is the cell making glucose or is the cell breaking down glucose is a very, very important consideration. The cell makes that determination without even uh, thinking about it. You get to study it. OK. Catabolism versus anabolism. All right. When we look at catabolism, we see the large molecules being broken down. The large molecules in the cell, of course, include fats which aren't all that large. From an energy perspective, though, fats contain more energy per gram than any of the other categories. Fats are very, very rich in energy. Polysaccharides. We'll talk later in the class about glycogen, which is a polymer of glucose. It's stored in your liver. It's stored in your muscles. And glycogen uh, is a polysaccharide. Proteins. Proteins, of course, are um, sources of energy when we break them down. It takes energy for us to make them. As we eat proteins in our diet, we are getting amino acids. We are also getting um, the energy from the breakdown of those proteins, and that can be used in many ways. To go upwards, we go through anabolism. To go downwards, we go through catabolism. So down here, we see catabolism going this direction. Go upwards, we make anabolism. Okay. Um, that's pretty much what I want to say there, I think. Carbon, carbon is a, uh, obviously a critical atom that is involve, involved in biology. And carbon can exist in a variety of oxidative states. Okay? So on the far left, we have the most reduced state of carbon. On the right, we have the most oxidized state of carbon. Carbon dioxide is the most oxidized state of carbon. As we move from left to right, going from one oxidative state to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, each one of those steps releases energy. And that's just reinforcing to you that oxidation is a source of energy. Yes, ma'am? I'm sorry? I think this is a basic organic chemistry principle. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to, to redraw it, but I think you should certainly know that something that has only carbons and hydrogens is more reduced than something that has an alcohol, and that an alcohol is certainly more reduced than an aldehyde or ketone, and that that's more reduced than a um, carboxylic acid, and that that's more reduced than a carbon dioxide. So I guess in a sense, yeah. I mean, um, that's a basic organic chemistry thing, right? So <laughs> it's a long answer for a short question, basically. Okay, so going through this, and that's what the cell is doing. The cell is largely starting 
when the cell is burning glucose, it's largely starting from things like this. And it's going ultimately all the way over here. So we can see there's a lot of energy that's coming from the oxidation of sugars. When we start with fats, they're largely coming from this point. So they get one extra step in that process, and fats therefore have more energy stored in them than do carbohydrates do. Than do carbohydrates do, whatever that means. Okay. Um, redux. So, <clears throat> redox reactions refer to reduction oxidation. You talked about them in organic chemistry, I'm sure. Uh, redox reactions, I always like to point out that for every oxidation, there is an equal and opposite reduction. So what is oxidation? Oxidation involves the loss of electrons. What is reduction? Reduction is the gain of electrons. Now, in this case, we see ethanol, which is an alcohol on the left, being oxidized to acetaldehyde, which is an aldehyde on the right. This is an oxidation reaction, because if we count the electrons over here, and we count the electrons over here, we see we've got 10 electrons. Over here, we've got 12 electrons. Two electrons have been removed. That means that ethanol has become oxidized. So it's not just a matter of definition. It's an actual real life thing. Those electrons were taken away, and something has to happen to those electrons. Now, biologically, what happens to those electrons is we have electron carriers that gobble them up. Biologically, electrons are gobbled up by electron carriers. This allows the cell to exert some control because electrons can't just go flying free. If they fly free, we have real problems because they attach themselves to the first things that they find and they make them extraordinarily reactive. Reactive oxygen species, for example, that I've talked about in this class arise from oxygen having an extra electron. Okay? So it's important that those electrons be managed and those electrons are gobbled up by electron carriers. Well, I said for every oxidation there's an equal and opposite reduction. We can see here, here's the oxidation. Where's the reduction? Well, when the electron carrier grabs the electrons, it's becoming reduced. Okay? It's not the reversal. If I wanted to go backwards, that would be a reduction. But I'm pointing out that when I go in this direction to the right, there's actually two things that's happening. Oxidation here, reduction. This is going to go on to an electron carrier. OK. Here's one of the electron carriers. And no, you won't need to know the structure. NAD is a very, very common electron carrier in cells. Okay? The relevant part of NAD that grabs the electrons is this ring up here. You can see this ring being in the oxidized form here, in the reduced form over here. No, you're not going to have to draw that. When, NA, when NAD is in the oxidized form, we call it NAD+, plus, meaning it has a plus sign on it. Electrons generally move in pairs. So when NAD plus gains two electrons and one proton, it becomes NADH with no charge. Why does it have no charge? It's very simple. We start with NAD+. Plus. We add two minuses to it, which are the two electrons, which gives it a minus one charge, right? and we have one proton which has a plus one charge, we end up with NAD that has a zero charge. So I said electrons and protons are involved in reduction. That's what we're seeing here. This guy is grabbing electrons, and in this case, one proton, in order to um, end up as NADH. Now, if I had this NAD accepting protons in the last reaction, I would have the alcohol plus NAD goes to the aldehyde plus NADH. Okay. There are other electron carriers. There's a related molecule called NADP, which simply has a phosphate down here. It has all the exact same things up here. And not surprisingly, when it gains electrons, it's called NADPH. FAD is another common electron carrier. And FAD